Hello and welcome. I'm Donna McKay, the Executive Director of Physicians for Human Rights, PHR. Thank you so much for joining us for our speaker series on COVID-19, the pandemic, and the health and human rights implications. For the last 15 months, PHR has welcomed leading international voices in health equity, human rights, science, medicine, and research, as well as community leaders to this interactive platform. Um, since that time, 15 months ago, we've lost more than 3.4 million lives to COVID-19, a real horrific reality. Um, and so we continue to facilitate and invite conversations on the many facets and challenges that this global health crisis has laid bare. From our very first discussion in March of last year, we've emphasized that science must lead the way. And so today I'm just thrilled to welcome hundreds of you live with us today to hear from yet another very esteemed panel who will shed a light on a critically important topic, the reasons behind and realities of vaccine hesitancy around the world, how it's deterring COVID-19 vac uh, vaccination uptake and the ways in which medical professionals, public health institutions and community organizers are working to promote trust in the COVID-19 vaccine. I'm very thrilled and honored to welcome back to speaker series today's moderator, Dr. Heidi Larson. Heidi's the director of the Vaccine Confidence Project at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, where she serves as professor of anthropology and risk and decision science in the Department of Infectious Disease Epidemiology. She served in numerous global health leadership roles, including leading the global immunization communication at UNICEF, chairing Gavi's advocacy task force and previously serving mm -hmm. on the World Health Organization's strategic advisory group. Heidi, thank you so much for lending your valuable time and your extraordinary experience to lead us in today's timely and very important conversation. And I turn it over to you. Thanks so much. Well, we have a fantastic panel today and really looking forward to the conversation, the discussion. Uh, I'll just all the bios will be in the chat, but just to give you a quick, quick overview, we have uh, Dean Ayman uh, El Mohandes, the Dean of the City University of New York, Graduate School of Public Health uh, and Health Policy, where, is a where he is a tenured professor of epidemiology and biostatistics and a career pediatrician and public health researcher. Reverend Alan Herring is Executive Director of Faith in Action, and it's the largest grassroots faith-based organizing network in the United States. We have Dr. Ingrid Katz, who's an associate faculty director at Harvard Institute, sorry, sorry the Harvard Global Health Institute, uh, and a physician in the Department of Medicine at Brigham and Women's Hospital, and a research scientist at the Center for Global Health at Mass General. And finally, we have Professor Charles Wisong, uh, director of the Cochrane uh, South Africa at uh, the South African Medical Research Council. And he's an extraordinary professor along with our extraordinary panel today <laughs> uh, at Stellenbosch University and an honorary professor of epidemiology and biostatistics at University of Cape Town. So before we uh, go on, we've got a, a rock and roll panel here <laughs> and we'll jump right into some uh, some field experience, actually. Uh, let's start with the South Africa perspective. Um, Professor Wiesong, how can you tell us a bit about what you're seeing in the landscape of vaccine confidence in South Africa? Yeah, thank you so much for, I'm glad to be part of this uh, <laughs> esteemed panel. What we're seeing in South Africa is that for, if we take the case of COVID-19 vaccines, we are just actually at the beginning, only about uh, 500,000 South Africans have been vaccinated. I am delighted that I was one of the very first, I got my vaccination uh, two weeks ago. So a large majority of South Africans are interested, they intend to take the vaccination, the vaccine, but about a third uh, have uh, expressed various concerns from what we are seeing from the various surveys. And what we are seeing is that Though some people have genuine concerns about safety, about efficacy, and which we need to uh, address with empathy. But that also, wh what we're see seeing is that people actually, uh, vaccine hesitancy expresses itself in our community where people, you, you know, the various social factors 
that leave people. So it's not just at individuals, but as communities. And people have various ways of expressing vaccine hesitancy. At times, it might be discontent with something else, but they have that is their only way of expressing it as uh, vaccine hesitancy. So. Thank you um, very much. That certainly um, reflects some of the trends we're seeing in a number of countries, actually, that vaccine hesitancy um, has a lot of other underlying issues, which makes it a challenge for immunization programs uh, because the, some of the drivers of vaccine hesitancy are well beyond the immunization program. Um, let's move to New York um, and, the, and some of the challenges uh, or in the U.S. more broadly, because I know the research that's happening out of City University of New York, New York uh, spans the country and is really finding some very interesting um, issues. Why don't I turn it over to the Dean? Well, again, thank you for including me. And uh, as you mentioned, we, we recently completed uh, several polls, uh, starting with very local polls in, in our neighborhood in Harlem, in New York, and then going to New York City and nationally making comparisons across various metropolitan areas, including Dallas, uh, Los Angeles, Chicago. Um, and the findings are very, very interesting in terms of hesitancy and resistance. First of all, in New York metropolitan area itself, uh, resistance seems to be lowest uh, compared to other, uh, other metropolitan areas and nationally, where nationally we're finding approximately 20%. In New York City, it's as low as 8%. But we're also, uh, since the pandemic has been so politicized in the United States, we're finding that certain characteristics such as political leanings, which really have little to do with the, with the biology of, of the pandemic and, and the efficacy of uh, vaccine intervention, uh, seems to influence people's disposition in a very significant way where the numbers of resist re resistance uh, in, in the uh, resistors in their response is twice and three times as high in, uh, in groups that express, uh, that express uh, more conservative views. Uh, that is problematic, but at the same time, some of our polls are showing that our preconceived notions and perhaps stereotyping groups ba based on racial affiliation or ethnicity are actually not accurate. One of the polls we conducted in Harlem, for example, with a large percentage of African-American and Latinx populations. We found at the time that 65 uh, years and older were uh, in fact eligible for the vaccine, that there were no significant differences across racial group, be it white, African-American, Latinx, uh, or, or Asian. But when we compared uh, segments of Harlem itself where certain parts of our community had less access uh, to vaccination sites, we found that there we could have uh, comparisons between East Harlem with less access and Central Harlem with more access. That's where we found differences in vaccine coverage. So we are taking a fresh look every day and with the rollout of vaccination, we are relearning and overcoming some of our preconceived notions and trying to deal with some of the new and significant risks. Um, one of the things that are most important in our findings is that most respondents said that they would like to get the vaccine at their doctor's office or at the pharmacy. And as you know, doctor's offices, primary care offices in the United States have neither been equipped nor privileged to vaccinate uh, their, uh, their patients. And uh, most of the vaccination sites were outside of the regular primary care sites. And that in itself is seriously problematic since every routine healthcare visit is a missed opportunity for a vaccination. Yeah, fantastic. I mean, I, I hope this opens our eyes when we get back to kind of normal <laughs> routine vaccination to um, uh, overcome our preconceived notions about what's really um, in the minds and, and hearts of people. Um, let's turn to Reverend Herring. Um, what about the faith-based perspective on this? How does that play out 
in the layering of all the different influences? Well, thanks for the question, Heidi, and thank you, PH, uh, PHR, for uh, having us on to talk about this really important topic. And thanks to all the other panelists. Uh, it's honor for me to be here and join you because um, in conversations about matters such as this, often the faith community or faith voices are absent. And, um, and I think when, we, when, when those voices and those perspectives aren't brought into the picture, we're not able to always completely understand or better understand things like this phenomenon, vaccine hesitancy. Um, it's not new, right, for uh, the, 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 the uh, hesitancy of, of pockets of, of our population to uh, expose themselves to vaccines, this vaccine and other vaccines. It is not a new phenomenon, but it is one that, that, that is, uh, I think, exacerbated by um, the deadly impact of this, of this virus and, uh, and the fact that it is a, a global experience that we're all trying to contend with. I think uh, for people of faith, uh, the challenge is uh, who to listen to, who are the trusted voices, who do you pay attention to, and what are they saying? And I think that there's plenty of evidence, uh, at least anecdotal for us in our work, um, just as an aside, we, uh, Faith in Action is a, a large national uh, organization with uh, member and participating organizations in 25 states. And we're organizing in, in over 150 cities in, in, in the United States and also in rural and suburban spaces. And so what we are experiencing and what we are learning from our clergy and from their experiences in the field is that uh, where there is hesitancy, it's related to the quality of information that people are getting where they're getting that information from and who, and who they can trust. And since many of the uh, congregations both Christian, Jewish, Muslim and, uh, temples of many faiths, since many of them are uh, people of the congregants or people of color or in urban communities, this is a, a really important issue because uh, let's be really clear. And I think Iman um, was, was kind of uh, alluding to this. Um, the experiences that people have, particularly poor and working people, people in, in, in inner cities or uh, folks who are living in, uh, in rural uh, communities is, is quite different than the experiences that, that many of us might have in rural uh, or in, in suburban settings. Uh, where we get our information from, the, even the, the, the uh, availability of, of good information is really a challenging thing. And, um, and for many folks of faith, uh, particularly people of color of faith, They've had real world experiences, not just, you know, um, the stories about the Tuskegee experiment and other uh, and other stories where where uh, people of color have uh, been uh, manipulated, used and abused by healthcare systems. But they have present day experiences where, uh, you know, accessing health care, going into a hospital or even a doctor's office can be really challenging. People are exposed to microaggressions. People are exposed to uh, indifference on the part of caregivers. This is not to paint them all in, in, a, in a kind of a blanket condemnation, but to just add this reality. And so uh, for those of us in the faith community, our, uh, our, our work in this moment is to try to be a good and consistent voice for good quality information and to encourage people uh, to rely on those trusted voices and then to actually deal with some of the real world struggles that people have in getting the vaccine. It's one thing to make it available for folks, but if that availability is miles away from their home, taking them out of their community with unstable and unreliable transportation, requiring them to take, take time away from work, time they may not have, and employers who are not necessarily sympathetic to them. These are some of the issues that folks have to contend with and those of us in the faith community. Our job is to try to help folks um, deal with those realities and remain vigilant and take good care of themselves and their families. So it's quite a challenge and I'm looking forward to this conversation. Thanks very much. I, I think that real world dimension is, is really important. Um, it, it plays out in different ways in different, I mean, the part you talked about with just getting there to get the vaccine, um, uh, it was also a point that Eamon raised um, and is equally true in, in many corners of the world um, that just having the vaccines uh, delivered to the airport even, <laughs> how does it, where does it go from there? Um, um, oh, now 
I was just looking at another question that just came in, but before, before going there, um, Dr. Katz, can you reflect on some of the historic impacts of vaccine hesitancy and its roots and how you think it's playing into some of these issues around COVID vaccine uh, now? Thank you so much, Professor Larson. And thank you to PHR and to this wonderful community here and my co-panelists for this critical discussion. So I have a, I have a few thoughts about this and it, and it actually goes back to Reverend Herring's remarks just now around trust. And I think as a healthcare provider myself, I have faced these challenges over the last year when patients reached out to me and my, my colleagues asking for help and guidance. And then of course, testing and then vaccination. And so much of the time we were left empty handed and you could see there was an impact and certainly an erosion of trust in these circumstances um, and a belief that shifted a bit from a healthcare system that would kind of always be in abundance to one that was really constrained. And it was certainly the first time that many people who work only in the United States as physicians had experienced this. We have been incredibly fortunate to have a very well funded healthcare system. And I think because of the work that I do in other parts of the world, um, this wasn't, this was something that unfortunately I have seen many physicians and nurses and community health workers navigate globally. And when you think about the historical context, you have to think about systems of oppression that have been in place over multiple generations and the inequity that has existed there. So often when we think about a narrative in our mind of the patient is hesitant, which is sometimes a trap that healthcare providers could fall into, even a quick note to say, oh, the patient is vaccine hesitant, it's really critical to stop ourselves and think about these systems and the layering of oppression that happen, certainly in the United States and certainly globally. And um, Dean Elmohandes's data are really fascinating yeah. because you can see actually quite a bit of nuance in these findings. And if you look globally, what you'll see is really significant associations between vaccine uptake and vaccine confidence, sources of trust, and other factors that are way more granular than kind of governmental responses. And sometimes it comes down to relationships that people have with individual healthcare systems or communities of faith or other places where they know that they can get accurate information. But we have seen over and over again when parts of the world are devalued, mm -hmm. that they are not getting the vaccine that they need. And we see this playing out real time right now mm -hmm. with massive healthcare crises and in certain segments of the world and other parts of the world, like the United States right now, starting to talk about you know, return to normalcy, that this continues to erode the trust mm -hmm. and the confidence that we are hoping to fortify. And so I think all of these individual decisions are always layered in both the collective history of a region, a collective history of a group of people, but also one's personal experience. And I think understanding the historical context of colonialism and oppression and a lack of access to life-saving vaccines and medications can really help inform a lot of these conversations. Thanks very much. Can I, can I just um, st turn back to Reverend Herring on uh, picking up on Ingrid's points, if you had yeah. um, anything more to add on the long-term systemic inequalities. Oh, I just really appreciated Ingram, Ingrid's uh, comments. They were just so, so right on. I think you're absolutely right, Ingrid. And if we come at this from this place of hesitancy without fully understanding all of, the, all of the important dimensions that are involved in this, that we won't quite capture it. So I really appreciate your comments. Ingrid said, among, among all the wise things that she said, I think one of the 
one of the things that she doubled down on was this issue of trust and, and, and trust in relation to people's experience with healthcare systems. So let's be really clear that um, in, uh, in, our, in our cities, but also in our exurban and rural communities, mm. um, there are many folks who have very little positive experience with healthcare systems and healthcare providers. You know, we're used to thinking of people having a primary physician, but that is not the reality for many, many, many people. Their point of access to healthcare systems is, is in many cases, the emergency room. Uh, even if it's not a dire emergency, because there isn't a family physician, a local healthcare system that's reached out to them, uh, that's where they access uh, healthcare. And um, as valiant as those dear brothers and sisters are in emergency rooms across the country, that's a very intimidating and formidable uh, place. Uh, and so I, I, Ingrid's absolutely right that factors into it. But I think what also factors into it is people, people know when they're not when they're not involved in a conversation. People know when they've been left out. People know where they're not welcome. And, um, and if the first real legitimate contact we're trying to have with folks from, from this place of trying to get people vaccinated, it, it, if this is the first contact or the first you know, effort to go, go deeper into communities than we have before, then you can understand that people are gonna be reluctant. Um, this issue of trust is absolutely critical. But, but let's, uh, let me just add this last piece because I think Ingrid was alluding to this. So you have uh, trust and maybe inexperience dealing with the healthcare systems and healthcare providers. And then that's indexed against real world challenges around transportation and, um, and the ability to get free from work, uh, leaving children unattended at home. These are the real things that people have to contend with, right? Uh, when I got vaccinated here in Baltimore, uh, I was in a long line, I'm not complaining, um, but there was another line parallel to mine um, that was for folks who spoke Spanish only. And, um, and the challenge was many of them had their children with them because there's no one to take care of those children at home. And there's also the language challenge. And thank goodness there were really, really beautiful folks there from a local a nonprofit called CASA that was able to, to help folks. But if they weren't there, they would probably not have had the same kind of experience and may not have gotten vaccinated and been able to, um, to make sure that they're able to come back the second time. So I just really appreciated uh, Ingrid's uh, words there. Thanks. Uh, Heidi, can yeah. I? Uh, sure, sure. Yeah, and the, jump yeah. in. Yeah. So what we're also finding, I'm sure from this discussion, we are seeing the social nature of vaccination. And this mm -hmm. social nature of vaccination views is, is not unique to COVID-19. We have found in our other work on childhood vaccination uh, in South Africa and uh, elsewhere in Africa, that public views uh, about a diverse range of vaccines and vaccination program is inherently social. For example, in a, we did a Cochrane review being a, a, from a Cochrane Center. In a recent Cochrane review of qualitative evidence, we found that views and practices around childhood vaccination reflected multiple webs of influence, meaning, and logic. And these are social, political, structural, and moral. And so it reveals that through their vaccination choices, parents are often communicating not just what they think about vaccines, but also who they are, what they value, and with whom they identify. So based on this, taking uh, these social worlds seriously, placing them at the center of efforts to reduce hesitancy and promoting COVID-19 vaccines, we think it is very, very important. So we need to, the efforts need to go beyond just education and we need to understand where people are coming from. Yeah, I, I think we also have an opportunity to use this, uh, this response to the COVID-19 as a unifying initiative uh, for nations and peoples. And, you know, we're beginning to see, for example, an initiative here in New York and in other states where people are being encouraged to, vac to go and get vaccinated because they will then get a, they will participate in a lottery. And so we're playing into the hand of, rather than you know, resorting to mobilizing people in an environment of advocacy and support, 
we're resorting to these uh, very simplistic approaches like, well, you know, uh, and, and it, uh, of course, in the beginning, there will be some people who are predisposed uh, to, to participate in that lottery, but is that going to be the national response? Are we going to get the United States vaccinated because every single one that has not, the 50% that have not so far are waiting for that opportunity of a lottery to participate? It's somewhat simplistic and, and you know, it plays into our own stereotypes. So this is an opportunity for us to think more broadly in terms of even the very simple premise of behavioral theory that has taught us over and over that you know, barriers are two times as important as incentives. Overcoming barriers in people's mind is two times as, as effective as incentivizing them. And, it, and you know, Alvin, you're so right that life barriers, real, real life barriers, are going to become more important in the next wave of vaccination. Early adopters, those that are more empowered, more resourceful, uh, have better access, are going to be the ones that will rush. Uh, I, I was one of them, you know, uh, competing for the early opportunities of a, uh, an appointment to get the vaccine. But these people will get vaccinated. And then we have a, a, a big uh, proportion of our nation and of the world population that are met with real life obstacles and real life priorities where the vaccine as the pandemic itself perhaps wanes will not become their first priority unless we make it easier for them and in as they participate in their life activities the vaccination becomes available uh, but the idea of making an appointment and going and waiting or going somewhere not close or going somewhere that doesn't fall into their daily schedule will become a more significant challenge to their daily lives than it, it was perhaps for me or uh, how I personally qualified it. And that's a very, very important element. And I think uh, you know we are seeing now almost a one third decline on the average number of people that come to appointments to get vaccinated uh, only over the course of a few weeks. And, uh, and we are now in a position to really dig into a better understanding. And of course, trust and confidence is important, but just as important in my mind is going to be facility access and practicality of the environment that provides this public health intervention. Thanks uh, very much. I I really think that this um, the importance of thinking more broadly and and this is a historic moment. Um, we talk about how history is influencing us now. I mean, hist <laughs> history going back from today, but this will be um, a historic a year that is remembered for many many reasons. But within that. Um, will be vaccines in not a small way. And I think it is an opportunity to change the nature of relationships. I mean, as Charles said, the, the social nature of vaccine and that also weighs into the political, the religious, the who do you trust? I mean, trust has come up so many times already in our conversation and trust is relational. That's the nature of trust. Um, so if we can strengthen those networks, um, in ways that are responsive and people feel like, um, you know, that they're not being left out. Um, and the only way you can change someone's feeling of not being left out is don't let, leave them out. Make them feel like you're, you're actually making an effort not to leave them out, to be inclusive. And I think that that is actually a much more practical doable intervention than some of the more difficult, you know, ideological belief-based um, reasons that, you know, we also are challenged with. Um, um, there's one question that's, that's interesting that's come up um, saying, uh, observing that um, we're talking about politics, but no one on the panel is really from government, although I think we've all interacted. 
um, with government at different levels. But the question is, um, what would you say, and this is open to any of your comments, what would you say as to the role governments have in, in educating or combating vaccination? I mean, I, I can hop in briefly to- oh, Sorry, combating vaccine hesitancy. <laughs> 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 we went there already. Um, I um, had the great fortune of briefing now President Biden when there he was in a transition team about vaccines and um, the impact on education in this country, which has been massive, and and COVID and and uh, and that's impact. And I think, um, you know we have had very different governments over the course of this vaccine. And I'm sorry, of this, see, I'm, I'm jumping to, of this <laughs> pandemic. Yeah. And, you know, that's the context within the United States. And then you extrapolate globally. And so if I had an opportunity to sit with President Biden today, what I might say is we have to stop thinking about vaccines and essential medicines as a market, a, a market commodity. These are public goods, just like healthcare. And so when we try to commodify vaccines, it puts a price tag essentially on something that is life-saving. I mean, truly life-saving in this case and in the case of most vaccines that are out there. And it, it gives a metric of value to people globally. And I think in this case, we have to not just step up as a wealthier country globally, which you know I think, and thank you to PHR for putting our New England Journal piece in the chat. We tried to lay out there very clearly what types of investments should be made from um, the Biden administration. But more significantly, we have to shift the mindset away from commodifying vaccines and essential medicines. It's the same way that we have to shift our mindset collectively away from healthcare as a commodity and think about it as a human right. And when we have that as our center, then everything grows from that. And all the decisions that we can make from a policy and governmental standpoint, all the way out to community level contact will be informed by a much more cohesive and humane um, and human rights centered framework. And I think we have to be really putting that at the forefront. You know, at the same time, I think government reactions to the early phases of the vaccine have not helped anybody. You know, countries in Europe uh, saying that they won't use AstraZeneca at all or will stop using it. And, uh, you know, uh, Johnson and Johnson again, uh, you know, the, the approach to how they were going to deal with the early reports of complications in the United States have been far from perfect. And, you know, the populations, nations listen to these reactions and sometimes they're probably uh, not well thought out and not well strategized. And uh, I think governments should understand that their policies and their reactions uh, influence people's behaviors, not only at the time that these policies and reactions occur, but for a very long period, there is a recovery uh, from a, a country like Denmark's reaction, for example, to AstraZeneca. What does that mean to the Danish people, but not only the Danes? What does it mean to other Europeans? How do they regard this reaction? How do they take into consideration Will people from France say, oh, well, you know, the Danish government did the right thing? I mean, we live in a very interconnected world now. And one country making a decision or, uh, you know, is influencing the general response. And unfortunately, we're not in that level of cohesion where governments are talking to each other and across continents in terms of their approaches, their policies. Uh, and, and going back to what Heidi has been talking about now for a long time, you know, how can you trust government when you see reactions such as this? And, and which government do you trust? Do you trust, you know, uh, your country's government, another country's government, your local government, your central government? 
and there has not been the best coordination. I will say even in the United States, we, we have seen that various states and various governance in states have taken radically different approaches. And you know, people in Florida are not living in a silo or people in Chicago are not living in a silo. They read the paper and even within the same country, you see there are such amazing differences in approaches towards the public health response that leaves people kind of confused and, and rather cold. Well, I can, I can endorse that with, with data, actually. We've been um, collaborating with Africa CDC and doing quite a bit of um, listening uh, to perceptions about vaccines in a number of countries, but particularly we have multiple waves in Nigeria. And last summer, um, in June, 49% uh, of the Nigerian um, representative sample said they would, they strongly agreed that the COVID vaccines would be safe and effective. Uh, in December, that dropped to about 42%, um, or November, December, but it was still pretty high. In March, when the uh, discussions and debates in Europe started about the AstraZeneca vaccine, we saw on a precipitously on a daily basis mm -hmm. it it dropping, and it went it went to half, twenty four percent by the end of March, um, said that they agreed that vaccine the COVID vaccines were safe and effective. Um, so that that's an example, a, a measured example of the knock-on effect. And you know they're referring to the AstraZeneca vaccine because it was the only one they had available. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it is. Um, um, there's uh, another comment that is on the role of uh, what can the role of mainstream media and mm. social media play. Well, in our polls, in our national polls, we did ask people where they got their information. And uh, if you added cable and local TV together, then they were the largest source of information. And that was followed by social media. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, again, it's confusing. Uh, if you watch one channel of a certain political leaning, you'll hear one thing. And then if you hear another, there are they're you know following a different drummer altogether and so yeah. that's yeah. that's confusing to the average listener uh, definitely um i think charles wanted to also had a comment yes i think yeah with us in uh, well the different parts of the world are obviously at different levels with with us in in, in south africa as we're learning from the experiences that, uh, has, that have been talked about in, in the US where now uh, coverage is going down and uh, the, the lines for people who are standing up to for vaccinations are going down. In South Africa, we are still really at the very beginning. And our main problem at the moment, we know that various studies have shown that uh, hesitancy is a problem. Uh, people, uh, we are still, we still need access. And for governments, we talked about government, I think, with us, we know our government is doing a lot and they could even, they could do much more by creating more vaccination sites, increasing information, letting people know we have an electronic system where people are registering. And it, it does create problem for people, for communities where not many people have access to uh, ways of, to, to the internet to, to register. So we have opportunities where it's not only about government, where various civil society organizations, non-governmental organizations, if they all come together about giving mm -hmm. out the information of how people should register, where the vaccination sites are, and when mm -hmm. appointments are ready, facilitating people's access to mm -hmm. the vaccination centers and ensuring that people don't stay there for long. I think that, that would help. And of course, we know that eventually, we will once, uh, we will eventually Maybe uh, the, the, once we have reached a certain level, like where the US is, where uh, Europe is, we may need now to do a lot of effort to bring the people who are hesitant 
to, to the vaccination sites. And I think at that moment, in uh, incorporating broader trust building measures that focus on communication and dialogue, relationships, transparency, and community involvement and participation would be very important. And such efforts also need to be uh, cognizant of the fact that people often have many needs and priorities, and that acceptance of vaccination, acceptance of COVID-19 vaccination may depend on these other concerns also being met. So integrating vaccine hesitancy reduction initiatives within broader health and development programs would be important for us. But access at the moment is also a very important mm -hmm. issue, and we need to ensure that everybody who wants to get vaccinated uh, vaccinated, you should get access to the vaccine. Heidi, I wonder if I could take a stab at putting both those questions together real quickly. Sure. The one about government and as well as uh, the question about media, because I think the framing of this is is really very important. And I think to Ingrid's comment, and maybe Iman was lifting this, lifting this up as well, the framing is a little off. Um, you know, the framing today is really transactional oriented, right? Uh, we have a vaccine, uh, it sh you should come and get it. it, it's your civic duty, or it's available to you, it will preserve your health. And so th those are all great messages, but I think they really miss the point that most people who are involved in healthcare and healthcare providers came into that work because their hearts are moved by compassion. Yeah. And there's a, an important missing message here that, uh, and that's the message of compassion. Uh, we care about you. We care about your health. We care about your family. I think there's ways to demonstrate that, both in the framing and the narrative, but also in the way in which we go about making the vaccine available to people, where we make it available to them, and the incentives that we, that we perhaps provide. I mean, was talking about, uh, you know, that some states are now enrolling you in an opportunity to win a million dollars if you go and vaccinate get vaccinated. How about a, how, how about or have a, a beer a, <laughs> or how about a, a, a voucher or a, a week long voucher to use public transportation without cost? Yeah. Um, how, how about if you come and, and get vaccinated when you do that, we'll have available to you other health provide other other health providers and other services that might be of, of benefit to you. Like, let's think about it from this standpoint of compassion. Uh, and I think if we if we were able to do that, we would see much less hesitancy or we'd see uh, much less of the disconnect between people's real world experiences and the real world needs and this need to get vaccinated. So uh, and I think that's also true for the media, that the media has to stop. Uh, well, this isn't a complaint, not just uh, localized to this vaccine issue, but they have to stop sensationalizing this and make this a, a, a conversation between everyday people by highlighting the experiences of everyday people, the challenges of everyday people, and by framing this as a, as a, a moment where we can demonstrate our compassion and love for one another, where we can speak to across all the differences and all the identity frames with a, sing, a single and simple message, you matter, and we know you matter. We acknowledge that you matter, and because of that, we are compassionately uh, making this available uh, to everyone and, and specifically to, available to you. So I think, I think the framing of it needs to be, uh, needs to be changed, uh, I think rather significantly, actually, if we're going to get the other 50% of folks who up to now have, have not gotten vaccinated, at least in this country. And I think yeah. this probably applies abroad as well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. In fact, I, <laughs> you're, you was a deja vu to my days of working in the polio eradication campaign in kind of the poorest areas of India and northern Nigeria, where, I mean, I remember these these mothers saying, you know, uh, you keep coming with that polio vaccine, and this is like, and literally some of these children had 20 of them, and they said, but our kids are dying of measles. You know, you came through ankle deep shit literally excuse my french but mm -hmm. and they were right um mm -hmm. in the water and the sewage and the you know where's the clean water um you know what's going on here in in pakistan there was a boycott in one area and they said we'll take your uh vaccine mr governor if you give us electricity mm 
and and Publix, we saw this whole um, because polio was getting so much visibility, it became a platform to lobby for real felt needs. Um, so some of these, uh, particularly in the more difficult areas, um, they started having health camps where they called them health camps, where you could get an aspirin, you could get, yeah. you know, some uh, oral rehydration solution, or you could get something really basic. Um, and but the sense that they were taking the vaccine for the government, yeah. um, but not getting their own needs served was really yeah. uh, eye opening. And it's That's exactly word. what you said, we're, you know, we're kind of, <laughs> we're here. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think that's uh, in China, by the way, they're giving ice cream. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> um, but, you know, there's a little more. I'm sure there's a little more pressure behind the ice cream. But <laughs> anyway, or or persuasion, I should say, um, as there is in, in many locations. Um, let's see what um, we have too many questions for the next uh, 10 minutes, but um, there's also a question of, and I, I think we've, um, we've kind of touched on it in, in, indirectly, but uh, there's been a couple people saying, well, that's great at a community level or, or a public level, but how do we talk to our friends who just don't get it or just have their issues or their concerns? So how do you, maybe maybe as our, in our kind of wrap up discussion is, how do you have these conversations? Um, uh, in, you know, we're all sitting in different situations um, and, you know, how do you start? I mean, I, I can jump in as a, as a physician um, who, who has these conversations sometimes with patients um, and just as a community member. And again, this is recognizing we have abundant availability now in this moment in the United States. This was not the case before. Um, I really loved um, what Reverend Herring was saying that compassion, lead with compassion and listen. I think a lot of us who have um, kind of had our heads in this space for the last year and a half thinking about the science and the policy, um, it sometimes can feel internally conflicted when we hear conversations that run against the data that we may have familiarized ourselves with. But there's no way forward without compassion and no way forward without a, an openness to understanding why people are making the decisions they are. And through the work I've done, which is primarily focused on HIV, one thing I've come to realize over time is that people's decision-making is, is using their own framework is extremely rational within the context of their lives. It may not feel rational to us, especially as doctors, we love to kind of say, this is the prescription. <laughs> and, um, I think we really have to be willing to open ourselves up to understanding all the nuances that people have in their lives and the complexity of the lives they have and all of the factors outside of them that are not due to them at all that we've already discussed here that have led them to this decision. And ultimately, I do think the more that we can lead with compassion and listening, the more that we have the potential to build that trust whether it's with patients or our friends or family members over time. Thanks, I, I would echo that. And I think the sheer act of listening already sends a signal that you care about what the other person thinks. Um, Actually, I would also add to that, providing real practical help to yes. somebody else that needs to get the vaccine. I yeah. mean, once I'm once you to... open the space, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I will babysit for you today. Yeah. I will, I will yeah. do something for you today rather than pontificate about it. Uh, be practical. You want to help your friend get vaccinated? You want your family member get vaccinated? Get down to the level of what would take for mm -hmm. him or her to be able to go and get vaccinated today and help him mm -hmm. or her with real life needs. I think the conversation all of us have boiled down to real life 
life reality, life priorities, and that the, the next chapter in vaccination will be amongst people who have urgent conflicting life priorities. I think mm -hmm. also going back to uh, responses from New Yorkers, many of them said, I, I will get vaccinated to protect myself and I will get vaccinated to protect my friends and family. These are two very important elements. Amongst those that are more hesitant and more resistant, their response is centered around so that the economy gets back uh, to normal, so that I can, you know, so that I can uh, participate in more, uh, more easily in daily activities. So we need to understand that, that people respond, I, I think really very importantly as Ingrid said, it's not, it's not monochromatic, it's not monolithic. People will have different priorities, different needs, and we need in our messaging to reach out to different people with things that matter to them, rather than, you know, uh, we have to be informed by their questions, their needs and their priorities. And I will say, I'll say to my sister, okay, I'll take care of the kids today. Go get the vaccine. I know you're very busy. Or, you know, my sister will say, okay, you know, I'll, I'll do the cooking for you and for your children today. Huh. I, know, I know you need to go and get the vaccine. So we, we need to go down to very basic and simple things. Or yeah. I will drive you. I know, I know you have uh, your car, uh, you, you have to sell your car. I'll drive you. Uh, let's go and get the vaccine. So this needs to become more of a communal activity. Yeah, I think that's a great way. Go ahead, Charles. Yeah. Yeah, that's a, I definitely agree with that, with what has been said and what the other panelists. And since we are all different countries, at uh, different stages, I think listening to the communities, like has been said, is very important. Listening and engaging communities and using community leaders, because we know that in-group uh, norms and habits have a big influence on group members. So having community members, like it has been asked, how do you talk to your friends? So you engaging your friends with empathy, with transparency and honesty would really develop trust and probably lead those who are hesitant to be able to take uh, the vaccines. Yeah. And then there are those folks who, um, who, are, uh, who are still afraid. Uh, frankly, a, a, a New York Times, um, University of Chicago study showed that one, uh, one fifth of Americans know someone who has died from COVID-19. Mm -hmm. So there are still some of those folks who are afraid. And as our other panelists have said, you know, um, interacting with them in a compassionate way, listening out, offering real world uh, support. These are all, I think, extraordinary steps that we can take. And these steps also um, show a great deal of compassion. We're not out of this yet. And uh, we've, we've got a ways to go. We could be using this moment right now to really radically change the equation around uh, who gets access to healthcare, who's involved in the conversation and how they access it. Uh, so uh, I, I, I support all the work of everyone on this panel and those who have been, been tuning in who are trying very hard to change the script, if you will, uh, and change the perspective and the frame and make it much more human much more humane and much more compassionate. Just really grateful to have had this opportunity to spend some time with you all this morning. Thanks so much. Do we have, um, I think we're about to wrap up here. Um, I see the clock, the big clock ticking in front of me. Uh, this is great. I think we could go on for a while. There's so many stories that, that come to mind and uh, Ingrid, I also worked in AIDS for a long time, and, and the notion of people's risk perceptions really struck me. I remember mm. working, working on, on PrEP in, in Kenya, and some of these women said, I don't know, you know, I, I'm less worried about HIV than, than getting pregnant, or, you know, I'm more worried about getting beaten up than, than yeah. getting sick in 10 years. Um, you know, help me out with my immediate um, concern. So I think, I think that's been quite a theme today about the real world, the realities, um, the compassion, the trust, and, and let's get practical. As I said, I think we need both. We need to make space for the practical by being open. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks so much. It's been fantastic. Thank you.
Thank you all so much, Heidi. Thank you. First, you know, thank you. This amazing panel, as you said, we could have gone on and on for a lot longer. There was so much to say and talk about, but thanks for setting the table for this critical conversation up front. And then just like helping us to understand the very important dimensions that drive hesitancy and then taking us through some very practical ways forward, not just for today, but as Heidi said, an opportunity now in a moment to change the nature of vaccine for the future as well. So, um, you know, changing the systems and our approach. And thank you, uh, Reverend, for reminding us that in addition to trust, we need to apply compassion. So I just wanna thank you for the very practical solutions for a very complex and urgent situation. And Heidi, thank you for the brilliant moderation today. And thanks to the audience for joining us. The discussion will be available on PHR's website later. So consider sharing this back out on your social media platforms and with others who will benefit from these really important insights. Thank you all so very much. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. You all made it easy for me. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Heidi. It's a great job.